All right, hello. So um, yesterday, Sean and I gave a brief introduction to our digital twin journey. And today, we're going to be go, uh, going into a more expanded version of this. Um, unless it may not have been entirely clear yesterday in the, on our digital twin journey conversations, but there was two parts of it. One part is what actually exists today and is part of I2B21.8.1, and which is more vision part and the direction we're working on. Um, I was describing the parts that are available in the I2B21.8.1, and Sean was talking more about how we might leverage LLMs to improve on this in the future. So this session over the next um, hour, is it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, almost an hour. <laughs> right. So um, we're going to be talking about, with, with Jeff Klan, what's called the Computational Phenotype Pipeline and Loyalty Cohorts. And this is something that you'll be able to run at your institutions um, right now. Um, it's brand new, as I'm going to talk about, it's complicated, and you may run into some problems, and we'll work with you and help you out on that. But that, that part is something that's actually live now at institutions. And then later this afternoon, um, you'll be seeing the demos of the LMs and future directions that this might go. So that's kind of the big distinction over here. So this stuff is um, describing the algorithms that are, going, that are available today for computational phenotypes. It's not leveraging LLMs. This is more traditional AI ML methods. So this, we saw um, the Venn diagram before. There's the patients with, in this example, type 2 diabetes and the patients who have the code. And multiple hospitals, we have found that about half of the patients with a diagnosis code for type 2 diabetes actually have type 2 diabetes. And this could be for a number of different reasons, that the patient was given the code for billing purposes and they're being evaluated to see if they have diabetes. Or they might have type 1 diabetes and just miscoded as type 2. Um, or it could just be data errors or other things in the data that result in this. As a result, the codes for many conditions have low precision precision for predicting the patient's true condition or phenotype. Again, meaning that you'll drag the concept into your query tool and get a number, but much fewer patients actually have that. And the problem with this is that clinical trials will overestimate the number of eligible patients from the electronic health record. And when you actually start to try to recruit these patients, you realize that these weren't actually patients that are eligible for the trials. You end up with low yield from your queries. So for many years, people have been talking about computational phenotypes, which use algorithms to predict which patients truly have the disease. I put algorithms in quote here because that means a lot of different things to different people. So we've had a very simple algorithm inside of ITB2 from the very beginning, and that's looking for multiple occurrences. If the patient has two or more instances of type 2 diabetes in their chart, it's more likely that they really have diabetes than if the person only has one occurrence of it in their chart. So it's a, a very, very simple version of this, but um, it does work in a lot of cases. It increases precision, meaning that more the patients who, um, uh, more patients, uh, match, matching patients truly have your disease, but it reduces recall and that it filters out patients who may actually have it. I also can introduce biases by selecting sicker patients. The very sick patients are probably coming many times to your institution, and you'll be biasing the results by doing that. So it's a very sort of simplistic way of uh, addressing this problem. More complicated algorithms are rule-based phenotypes. So these are leveraging clinical knowledge to define inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, these bring together a bunch of clinical experts. They figure out which uh, combinations of diagnoses codes or other things in the chart um, are predictive of having patients with those diagnoses. These can be expensive to develop and, and to validate using chart review. Um, they often overlook the complexities and data quality problems and biases in the EHR data. It clinically makes sense, but the clinical experts may not be aware of some of the complexities inside of the data, and there may be a mismatch there. Also, these algorithms, when they're developed at one institution, may be very specific to the types of data that are available there and may not translate well to other organizations. Um, FKB or Phenotype Knowledge Base, is a website that has many of these phenotypes. It's on the order of dozens, though, and we're going to get back to that. Um, they don't have a 1,000 of these phenotypes because they're complicated to build. Um, many of these have been built through a consortium called Emerge. 
Um, they create these complex flow charts and they logically make a lot of sense. And if you have all the data, it will work extremely well. But if you don't have the data or there's data quality problems, these flow charts might not actually match the kind of underlying data that you have. And these are difficult to implement in I2B2. To have to code all this up, you'd have to do each one, each disease separately to build out the logic or create derived facts that match the logic in these flow charts. So in the computational pipeline that we're including in 1.8.1, it's based on AI or machine learning based phenotypes. And what these do are their algorithms, like logistic regression algorithms, that will estimate the probability that a patient has the phenotype of disease by combining many different features in the patient's chart. This might be diagnoses, medications, laboratory tests, or other things. It automatically selects the features that are relevant to the phenotype you're looking for and assign weights to them. Um, it does this all automatically, so you don't need to have clinical experts provide input to this. It will just look at the data in the electronic health record, the co-occurrences of things that appear with diabetes, what's um, uh, associated with patients who receive a lot of care for diabetes at the institution, and it can come up with the models on its own. So what you end up with, if there's not a Boolean determination if this patient has diabetes or not, it's more of a, a, a probability or a score assigned to the patients, and then you can decide the threshold of what you're gonna call diabetes patients or the ones you're gonna call um, kind of an incorrect um, code that was assigned to them. There are a number of different algorithms that we build on to leading up to the algorithm that we are actually including 1.8.1. One of the earliest ones was this paper on fee codes from 2010. The raw ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes are used for billing purposes. They're very granular and specific about the types of diabetes or the conditions you're looking at. And often investigators are looking for more of a roll up or higher level concept. So I just want type two diabetes patients. I don't necessarily care if they were there for complications or not complications or other things. So this is fee codes is just a raw mapping roll up into higher level categories. So it's easier to drag and drop a folder into your query and has all the stuff related to diabetes, but is not itself addressing the problem of patients having a code but not actually having the phenotype or disease. A major step towards that was an algorithm called Phenorm in 2018 developed by Tseng Shikai and others involved in ITB2. And this returns back to the idea of the more occurrences of the concept in a patient's chart, the more likely they actually have that phenotype, but it also normalizes by healthcare utilization, the number of visits that they have. So if a patient has three visits for diabetes, but only a total of four visits at your hospital, then they're probably coming to your hospital for diabetes care. But if they have 100 visits at your hospital and only three of them ever mentioned diabetes, maybe they don't really have diabetes and it was just, they were evaluating it at some point. So this is context that's important, not only the number of occurrences, but how that number compares to the total amount of utilization. So by normalizing by that, um, they're able to separate the data into these two populations. There's a clustering algorithm that gets run, and then it becomes, for many conditions, this very clear two kind of Gaussian spikes, one for the patients who have very few codes rel relative to the utilization, and the other ones who have a lot of um, visits for the condition compared to how much they're at the institution. And when doing this normalization, it's easy to find a cutoff point and say all the ones above it have the condition, the ones below don't. This has been validated on, across many different diseases at multiple institutions. It's a simple algorithm, but actually works really, really well. Um, there have been in, some enhancements over the, the last few years for this. Um, and that one algorithm's kind of evolved into two, one called Kesser and one called Comap. Kesser is knowledge extraction via sparse embedding regression. Um, don't ask me details about embedding regression. I'm gonna refer you to the statistician. So it's a, somewhat of a black box R script to me, but it does really terrific stuff. So you plug it into the pipeline that it helped um, develop. So what the embedding regression does is it takes the current occurrences co-occurrences of items within the chart. So what are the things that frequently co-occur within a time window with type two diabetes? And it puts that into this embedding space. 
Um, it basically converts your electronic health record into a bunch of vectors. And then vectors that are near each other are related concepts. So it'll tell me there are 200 concepts in the database that um, look like they have similar kind of meaning or are used in a similar kind of way as type 2 diabetes. It doesn't tell you if these are predictive for or against diabetes. It doesn't assign weights to them. It's just telling you that here's a set of related concepts. Um, and this algorithm runs fast. I can do this for every phenotype. So there's about 200, there's about 2,000 fee codes that roll up a few hundred thousand, I see nine or 10 codes, but a lot of the fee codes won't actually be used at your hospital or there are very few patients. So once you look at a certain minimum number of patients, there's about a thousand fee codes that are in use. It can go through all these fee codes within hours and for every fee code, give you a list of two or 300 concepts that are related to it. So it's like having um, a thousand clinical domain experts working with you in committees for weeks coming up with a set of relevant concepts to your model, but it does it all automatically and very quickly. It's optimized for fee codes, the hierarchy of Rx norm, um, LOINC, and CSS procedures, but you could feed in additional things to it if you want. If you have other kinds of concepts in your electronic health record, it can include those in the list of features that may be relevant. So that's Kesser. Then what you then you can do a lot of different things with that list of concepts. You can create a folder in um, your ontology that says diabetes related concepts, and inside of there list the 200 things that the algorithm found. And it might just make it easier if you're doing a, a diabetes study. You have all the stuff right there, and it's similar to the COVID-19 folder that. Michelle and others developed where uh, inside that COVID folder, it has a bunch of related concepts that just make it easy to do things. Um, people have created knowledge graphs out of the Kessler results. So you can click on diabetes, see all the things related to it, click on that and see all the things related to that and navigate through your data. And it can also be used for quality checks. If you see something really weird popping up with uh, as a related thing to type, one di uh, type 2 diabetes, you can go into your data set and use it to clean it up. But the, the, the use case we're going to be using for here is a set of features to feed into the second algorithm called COMAP. COMAP is Knowledge-Driven Online Multimodal Automated Phenotyping System. That basically means that it takes your data and that list of features and assigns coefficients or weights to those. So you have an actual phenotype model that it can run. The model will generate a score for each patient and then there's a uh, default threshold that gets set on how to define which patients have the phenotype. Um, part of these algorithms require you have sufficient amount of data for a patient to have confidence in the result. So if you only have one visit for a patient, that's probably not enough data to be sure that they have a, a disease. So um, a default in the Kessler COMAP algorithms are looking for patients who have three visits to the hospital over um, a period of time where you have good data. What I mean by that is at my hospital, we have data that goes back to 1997. There's only diagnoses that go back to 1997. Things like vital signs are more recent. So you want to start at the point where you have all the different data domains, and that's where you're requiring a few um, visits since then. Jeff will talk after me about a more sophisticated machine learning based algorithm called loyalty cohorts. And that's doing a more of, um, complex way of figuring out patients who have sufficient data to lead into this algorithm. And which algorithm you use kind of depends on um, what your data look like, what you see from the results of the models, how you want to fine tune things and so on. Um, so I said the phenotypes are not reliable for patients with very little data. So you're starting with a base cohort of patients who pass your initial filter. So this is, I ran the algorithms at my institution. This is what it looks like. So um, I'm showing diabetes, type 2 diabetes here, but I said I ran this on a thousand different diseases. Every single thing that I have in the chart, every one of those phenotypes or diseases come up with a list that looks like this. So for type 2 diabetes, it says that one of the things related are medications like glipizide or metformin. There are things that are not type 2 diabetes, like type 1 diabetes, but they sometimes get mixed up in patient charts. With this algorithm doesn't know that this is a different disease, but it does see that it's happening co-occurrently with patients with type 2 diabetes. It also has sequelae or other things that might be related. And I said you could do lots of different things with these lists. 
the second algorithm then assigns weights to those concepts. So if I'm building an algorithm for predicting patients with type 2 diabetes, of course, if they have a code for type 2 diabetes, it's good and there's a very high positive weight to that. But then the utilization, the total number of visits for ICD codes that they have, that gets a negative weight. Um, so you want to see patients who have a lot of diabetes but not that many other things. And then other concepts get different positive or negative weights depending on whether it's predictive or not predictive for the condition. When I load all my patients into this equation, I get a curve that looks like this. And then um, this uh, algorithm then fits two Gaussian curves to it. So it says this squiggle over here looks like there's this dash blue Gaussian curve and this solid orange one. And the orange ones are probably the patients with diabetes and the blue ones are the ones without them. You set a threshold where they cross, that's the default. And you say, okay, these are the ones with a score above that, which I'm gonna call the patients with type two diabetes. So this is kind of combining what you would get from an expert set of clinicians coming up with a set of features with then a machine learning algorithm that's building a model for it all in one. Both of the algorithms, Kessler and Comap, are designed to work in parallel. So you're not doing this pipeline a thousand times. You run Kessler once, you run Comap once, and what you get out of it are a, a table that lists phenotype and coefficient. So it might have like a million rows in here, a thousand different phenotypes with all the different features that they're associated with and the coefficients that go with it. So you're doing this in batch, it takes, hours to run for each step, but you're not running this nightly. You're running it once a year or once every quarter when you want to retrain your models. Um, it, and, but then within a few days, you've completed the pipeline and you have a thousand different machine learning algorithms, one for every single um, disease in the medical record. So you could take, here's my raw IC9 and 10 codes, and you can still allow investigators to query them, but then you have a whole separate thing, our kind of digital twins, which are the version of the diagnoses of phenotypes that patients that have gone through this filtering process to remove the, uh, the, the codes that we think are kind of incorrectly added to the patients and keeping these are the phenotypes we really think we have. This is an all entirely unsupervised method. Um, so when you get the thousand machine learning algorithms at the end, you don't know if they work well or if they don't work well. Now we've run this at multiple institutions across many different diseases and done chart review to, to confirm the accuracy of them. And probably about 80% of them work really well and much better than the raw codes. The other 20%, you know, something happened, you don't have enough data or the models don't converge well and the model doesn't work as well as you would expect. You don't know which one's ahead of time, but you do know the vast majority of them are probably working very well. Um, we've done chart review, I sent a bunch of them here, several dozen um, phenotypes that after the chart review in one of our institutions um, had a very high um, positive predictive value and was incorporated into um, the I2B2 instance. But the ones that you haven't done the manual chart review, Again, most of those models are probably a lot better than the raw codes. So you can go ahead and include every one of these phenotypes in your I2B2. You have to explain to users what this means. What's the difference between a raw ICD-10 code, an unvalidated, unsupervised machine learning algorithm, and then the, the subset of diseases where you've actually gone through and done some chart review and validation. When you're loading in the thousand not yet validated phenotypes. Again, I don't know if how accurate it is, but it can do some nice things with it. So here, I'm taking the thousand phenotypes. I look across all my patients. I see my three million digital twins have an average of six phenotypes per patient. These are the top phenotypes in that population. Other mental disorder, hypertension, lipid metabolism, hyperlipidemia, these are common stuff. So it's kind of what I would expect, but um, you know, I have, I have somewhat more trust in these numbers than if I did the same top diagnosis breakdown from the raw data. So in the ontology, you can combine all these things. So um, there's Michelle's Act 4.1 ontology that has a phenotyping folder inside of that. 
There's the fee codes folder, which is the raw IC 910 rollups to um, higher level fee code categories. But then our phenotyping pipeline makes two more copies of that fee code folder. One, which is called probabilistic not validated. So these are the thousand um, machine learning algorithms. They're done automatically and you can load all that in, but you let users know that some, most of these are working really well, but some of them don't, but it's kind of at your own risk, but it's probably better than the raw data. And then the fee code probabilistic validated. This is where you've done some chart review to confirm that the model is working as you would expect. You don't have to do a lot of chart review. You don't need a thousand gold standard chart reviews done. You only need to do about 20 patients just to confirm that the algorithm is selecting patients who really do have the, al have the disease. You can assign a positive predictive value and recall to it, and then users can say, okay, these are the few dozen phenotypes that have been confirmed, and when I'm using those in my query, I can have more confidence in the result. So it's all about sort of increasing how um, your confidence in the findings and the yield you're getting from the clinical trial recruitment. The raw data, you'll get the largest number of patients, but you're gonna have a lower yield. You go to the probabilistic not validated, you get a smaller population that more likely has the conditions. And if you have a, if you're studying a disease where you have a validated phenotype, you'll get the most accurate results from that. Then we also have the base cohort. These are those the starting population for this. So if you're looking for patients who do not have diabetes, you would say, I wanna find patients who are in the base cohort, but do not have the phenotype for it, rather than starting through your entire population and saying, I want the ones who don't have the, the phenotype. So this, this pipeline's available in the 1.8.1 code. It's in SQL Server or Oracle. It's not yet ported to Postgres yet, um, you know, as we get more feedback from sites in SQL Oracle, we'll see how much interest there is in Postgres and if we have resources to port it to that. I wanna talk a little bit about the implementation of this. Uh, there's a, we're not using sophisticated large language models or GPUs or other, some of the things you're gonna see later today. This could all probably run on your existing I2B2 infrastructure, but it's a much more complex software program. Um, the CRC cell of I2B2 is really just where you dump your ETL result and uh, the query result tables. There's a lot of new pieces that come into this phenotyping pipeline. Um, we have fact table views that might point to your OMOP where you're loading in the EHR data. You're loading in new things, the co-mappings, the gold standards that you're doing from the chart review. Um, Kessler and Comap have lots of intermediate tables. There's a lot of computation that happens in the database. You end up exporting some aggregate level data to run in R. You can either have CSV files that you pull out of your CRC cell and put it on a separate server where R is sitting, or you can point R directly to your database and run it that way. But most of the computation happens in SQL Server store procedures. That's the part that might take hours to run. The R scripts may take minutes or so to run. They're just doing the final steps in the analyses. Um, but there are a lot of components here. There are a lot of steps to this pipeline. So it's more complicated than your normal ETL. Um, the algorithms, they may not converge. There may be parameters that you need to tune. Um, some of the things I can help you with, some of the things I might need to set up a meeting with our statistician to go into some of the details of it. So um, we've installed this at a few institutions so far. Um, it's really exciting what it can do, but as some of the first users of it, you know, I'm expecting there'll be little glitches here and there that you'll run into, and we wanna work with you in figuring out how to improve this and make this work best. I don't think we're ever gonna get to the point where you just push the button and it's done. Just the nature of this as we're going just from simple SQL ETL to um, using machine learning or large language models to improve the results, there's always gonna be complexity of tuning and other work that you're gonna have to do. Um, one, of the, um, sorry, one of the last things I want to mention before I end here is 
one of the advantages of the Kessler COMAP algorithms is that this step here, um, before you send the results to R, is designed to create an intermediate table that's aggregate only, a co-occurrence aggregate table, a covariance aggregate table. So you're only sending aggregate information, not patient level data, to the R scripts. And what that allows you to do is in a federated network like Shrine or Enact, you can get the aggregate tables from each of the different sites in the network and you can combine them. You just add up the numbers in those aggregate matrices. Then centrally, you can run those R scripts and build a more robust phenotype. So without having to share patient level data, we can create phenotypes based on 100 million patients in the ENAC network with each site sharing the aggregate intermediate tables and not having to share the, the patient level data. It's a simpler model than federated learning where you're sending out analyses to each site and combining it. But here you can send aggregate counts like we do today in, um, in Shrine to a central location, run the results there and give each site a phenotype model that's been built across the whole network. So it's less sensitive to specific nuances of each individual site. Sites can retrain these, but allows you to build these robust, large, um, network-wide uh, models. And that's, I think, one of the kind of cool things about this algorithm, this ability to just send aggregate information to R as opposed to patient-level level data to R, which allows you to both separate the R server from your I2B2 server within your institution and also allows for federated learning across a large network. Um, it might be useful to stop and answer questions about this before we switch over to Jeff's part on loyalty cohorts. Are there any questions in the room? Oh. Hang on one second. Hey, uh, we have groupers like in our Epic that are pretty good at distinguishing these. And so I feel like we could use that to validate like if this is working. But you know, it might be difficult to validate 900. So my question is: Is there like a rough guideline for how many patients need to have this feature in our data for it to be worth kind of doing the chart review and seeing if it matches? Do you know what I mean? Right. So there, there's some defaults in there. So for um, the first step, Kesser, uh, the default is having a thousand patients in order to have enough co-occurrence information that we come up with that list of a couple hundred features. And then the second step in COMAP is creating sort of covariance matrix. So you need, um, uh, I think the cutoff is like 10 patients for each thing. So there are these thresholds there. You can tune it based on um, your, uh, your institution or how accurate you want these models. Uh, if you want to get into this, I pull in the statistician. You know, she'll always tell you you need more patients um, to get the more accurate um, uh, results. But then there's this better than what's the raw data. And you know, sometimes on some of the phenotype that I have, I'm probably having too few patients than what she's recommending. But the model is probably, again, better than the raw code. So you kind of have to balance that. You know, the, groupers and things like that, the, that first step, Kesser, you can set your list of features in different ways. Kesser is one algorithm for coming up with your list of features. Fee code is kind of another way of that grouping, doing it. The groupers and Epic are a different way. You might have clinical experts who are actually running a trial at your institution who are recommending things. I think we'll be hearing later about um, kind of called custom phenotypes, where the phenotype isn't a, a kind of established disease with an ICD-10 code, but a condition that doesn't have an exact billing code yet, where the investigators are coming up with the sets of concepts, or an LLM is doing that to, to put into there. So Kesser and COMAP are separate things. You can come up with a set of features any way you want, where we're providing Kesser as one method for that, and then COMAP will build a model from it. Yes, Michelle? Or, I have time for you. One more yeah. question. Are the phenotypes all common diseases or any of them rare diseases? Uh, uh, it depends on, again, how many patients you have. You're going to need a certain number of patients for the models to converge. So for a, a rare disease um, that you may have 100 patients at your hospital, it may not be enough patients for the, the model to come up with a set of features and for it to converge. 
Um, if you're a small site, and you're a clinical trial with a thousand patients, something that's common might be rare. And so it's, it's about how much data you have as opposed to um, the prevalence in the population. But aren't you pre defining them? This is, it's an unsupervised model. So in clustering, so if you just, if you don't have enough patients, it's not going to be able to come up well, the, like the coefficients. Define what phenotypes you're going to do, right? Like, like you said, you're doing type two diabetes. So. Right. So you can create, you can create your own, here's rare disease X that doesn't have an ICD code for it. Um, but if you have a list of patients in your chart who you think have that condition, you can say these are the patients with that condition, the number of times they've had it, and uh, these are the features, and then COMAP can build a model of it. But COMAP needs a certain number of patients for it to converge. It might work, but you know, the fewer patients you have, the increase in chances the model will just return with an error saying it didn't have enough data to assign the weights. All right, I think we should probably thank Griffin thank you. and uh, bring Jeff up for the next part. If we weren't able to answer your question, I would encourage you to reach out to speakers. I think one of our purposes of being here is to make these connections. So do reach out if you have questions that you uh, didn't get answered here.